I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Our guest today is Ed Jenkins, who served Georgia's 9th District in the United States Congress for 16 years. Ed, we're delighted to have you. I'm delighted to be with you, Bob. We want to share with you some of your experiences during those years you served in the Congress from Georgia's 9th District. But before we do that, we'd like to know more about you and your family and your early life in Young Harris, Georgia, and in Blairsville. Well, I was born in Young Harris, uh, but my family moved to Blairsville when I was just a baby seven miles away. But I've always been my family and uh, as well as myself have always been directly connected to young Harris because that was my father's home. My grandmother had a uh, boarding house on the campus of uh, young Harris College. It later was sold to the college but uh, for many years she ran a a uh, boarding house where a lot of students uh, stayed. And my father and he had uh, three brothers and three sisters all grew up there and went to school at Young Harris, as did I later. But in uh, Blairsville, uh, first of all, my father was a barber. And uh, he barbered in Young Harris, and then when he moved to Blairsville, he uh, he and uh, Zell Miller's uncle, B. H. Miller, owned a, uh, a barber shop in Blairsville. And until he uh, went to work for the TVA when I was a youngster, uh, I grew up around that barber shop. So I met a lot of uh, interesting uh, Union County characters and politicians and listen to them uh, intensely and really uh, enjoyed my youth there. My mother came from the Choi Stoi section of Union County and her father was a uh, revenue officer uh, in the 1920s and uh, so I also grew up uh, here in a a lot of stories about uh, making whiskey on the uh, mountain slopes uh, from him and uh, my mother. Uh, she was Scotch-Irish. My dad was uh, Welch and, and really um, had moved to Young Harris when he was a child from Western North Carolina, uh, from the Robbinsville area of North Carolina. His father uh, had died rather early, and his grandfather, my great-grandfather, had uh, moved down from Virginia into western North Carolina in the 1800s. Uh, there were six of us children. I have two brothers, uh, three sisters, and uh, all of us uh, left to hunt and fish and and play baseball and uh, none of us were the athletes that my dad was. He was an outstanding... Uh, I remember your dad. He was a great baseball player. He was a wonderful baseball player. He and loved your to, uncle. Tom and, and uh, Archie and Will. All of those boys played uh, baseball and hunted and fished uh, in the mountains. And uh, I really had a wonderful childhood simply because we didn't have much money obviously a barber didn't make much money but uh, we uh, had a very close-knit family so you you went to Union County High School and then to Young Harris College I did I uh, when I finished high school there were only 11 grades so uh, I finished when I was 16 and uh, immediately went over to uh, Young Harris College where I finished there in, in 1951 with you, Bob, and, and Miller. <laughs> Zell Miller. Uh, an infamous 
class, I might say. <laughs> uh, and then I served, uh, before I went to the University of Georgia, I served three years in the uh, Coast Guard, in Coast Guard Aviation. And uh, had a, enjoyed that as well because I got to spend about a year and a half in Alaska uh, in the Aleutian Islands during that tour. Got to fish and uh, didn't do much hunting because the hunting license cost too much for a 20 year old. But, uh, but I enjoyed my tour that was during the Korean conflict. And then uh, after Young Harris, the University of Georgia. I came back to the, uh, enrolled in, at the University of Georgia, did uh, one year there before I, of pre-law, and then went into uh, the law school. And I finished law school there in 1959. I had, uh, went to Emory one year at night because I'd, I had uh, run out of money. <laughs> so I got a job in Atlanta and went to uh, Emory Law School at night. At that time they had a night law school. And then I went back to Georgia to finish up. So I was sort of uh, a part of the class of 58 and 59. And then uh, immediately upon completing my uh, law degree and getting admitted to the bar, uh, Congressman Phil Landrum, who had uh, who served Georgia's ninth district for twenty something years, twenty four years, I believe, uh, was looking for someone, a young lawyer, to come to Washington to work in his office, and I agreed to do that and. Uh, really had a great experience there as a young staffer. I, uh, Eisenhower was present just going out of office when I arrived and uh, John Kennedy was elected uh, president and uh, I was at that inauguration and, and really uh, enjoyed my Washington experience. I was there for about uh, three years. Uh, some of the interesting people that were there at the time that I was there, uh, Bobby Kennedy, of course, had uh, was serving over on the McClellan Committee. He was uh, chief counsel for the uh, Labor Committee over in the Senate. And uh, Adam Clayton Powell was serving on Education and Labor Committee, and he became chairman while I was there. That was a big controversy because uh, at first they didn't seat him, you know, and uh, expelled him, I think, because he, he wasn't showing up, but the Supreme Court uh, reinstated him. And uh, Mr. Landrum at that time was the number three person in seniority on the Education and Labor Committee. And uh, the he was the one of the chief sponsors of the uh, labor reform bill of 1959, which was an extremely controversial piece of legislation. Uh, that was the Griffin-Landrum bill. That's right. Or Landrum-Griffin bill. Depending upon where, if you were in Michigan where, uh, where Bob Griffin was from, it was Griffin-Landrum. If you were in Georgia, it was Landrum-Griffin. But uh, there were some interesting people on that uh, committee and very strong personalities. Uh, Jimmy Roosevelt was uh, the son of FDR, was a ranking member of that committee from California. And he was supported very heavily by, uh, by labor. Some of the uh, people from the other side, the, the more conservative side, uh, Graham Barden, who was chairman of the committee from North Carolina, and uh, he was a very conservative uh, Democrat chairman, very bright fellow, and uh, did a wonderful job on the committee. And uh, of course, Johnson was in the Senate at that time, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and uh, Sam Rayburn was Speaker of the House. So it was a, 
with Rayburn Johnson, Kennedy, uh, you had a, a wide range of personalities in the Congress. Congressman Landrum, as I recall, was, uh, was chairman of the education, I believe, subcommittee uh, in, on that same committee. He, he was the third, he was, uh, it was a large committee, there was about uh, 35 or 40 members and he was number three or four on Education and Labor Committee at that time. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he never chaired the committee because uh, he was elected later to the Ways and Means Committee and he had to give up his uh, Education and Labor Committee status. But I recall, uh, some time in, in some research uh, that I've done that he uh, authored a bill that had provisions in it for these bookmobiles out in uh, rural America. And he I was, thought that was a great contribution. Yeah, he, he was a, a, a leading co-sponsor of that bill that provided uh, for the bookmobiles uh, to go through the rural areas. He also uh, uh, Dick Russell, Senator Russell, was in the Senate at that time, and uh, he worked with uh, Senator Russell on the lunchroom program uh, that Senator Russell was very interested in, and uh, and you had a lot of uh, powerful people in the House because uh, they were all Democrats, didn't have a, and they stayed there for long periods of time and built seniority. So you had uh, had about eight or nine uh, very strong personalities in the House as well as in the Senate. Your friend Zell Miller has been a very successful politician and uh, a good friend. Yes. And uh, I once read in the Atlanta Journal that uh, Zell Miller wrote in your annual when you graduated from the University of Georgia that you would be his best friend forever unless you ran for him, against him, for the United States Senate. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> he wrote that in my yearbook, and that's the only reason I never ran for the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had an opportunity uh, yes, once. Yes, I, I did. Yes, you did. Well, no, that was, I, I was kidding about that, but Zell Miller and I grew up together, and I knew his mama so well, and... Uh, and played baseball uh, with him and against him. And, uh, and, and when he was at the university, I was at the university at the same time. And we would, his wife Shirley would uh, sometimes cook spaghetti for us and, uh, and uh, we would talk politics. Uh, he and I were interested in the political realm since childhood because we had been around the political figures, local political figures. And incidentally, of course, his father had been the uh, campaign manager for Ed Rivers when Ed Rivers ran for governor. I think he uh, might have been a losing campaign, I believe Zell indicated. I, this was before me, but, uh, but uh, Zell was influenced early on by the political. A and when he, uh, when he was elected to the Senate, state Senate, uh, Landrum was very close to a fella from Young Harris in Towns County that was his opponent. Kaiser Dean was his name. And uh, I tried to commence to try to influence Phil Landrum uh, over towards Zell Miller because I thought that he was an up-and-coming young political figure and would have a bright future. And uh, he did become, although he ran against Landrum for Congress, and, uh, but he became a, a close associate of Landrum and a supporter. How do you deal <clears throat> with that, Ed? Here you are with an incumbent, popular incumbent congressman and having one of your best friends as an opponent. That was one of the most difficult things uh, that I had ever faced. Uh, but I have always been loyal, I think, to my 
uh, people I work with. And uh, when Zell unexpectedly entered the race, I guess in 1964, uh, I called him, told him, I said, now Zell, I work for Landrum and I, I'm going to be for Landrum. And I want you to know that. And uh, the same thing happened in '66. Even though I had uh, I had left Landrum and went in the U.S. Attorney's office at the time as a U assistant U.S. Attorney. Uh, but it was a rough time uh, mentally and emotionally because Miller was one of my best friends, and I could not. Uh, turned my back on Landrum, whom I had, I ran his campaigns <laughs> in addition to uh, working for him. So I stayed with Landrum, and I think Miller understood that. Well, with that background, when Congressman Landrum decided to retire, you decided to run for his seat. I had uh, been a federal prosecutor for about three years, and then I had returned to Jasper where Landrum lived and opened up a law office and uh, had practiced uh, several years and also at, at the same time did a lot of work for, for Landrum, uh, district work. And, and when he would have opposition, I would take off and run or help run his campaigns. So I knew a lot of people throughout the district primarily because I had been active in his political campaigns and uh, had uh, done a lot of his legwork uh, through the years. So he called me in uh, 76, 1976, and told me, uh, he called me in uh, about uh, September of that year, August or September, and said, I've decided that I'm not going to run, for sure. It had been speculated for some time that he would not. Uh, but if you want to get in it, I want you to know ahead of time. And uh, so I talked to my wife and didn't tell her how much money it would cost <laughs> to run. Uh, through those uh, 18 counties at that time. And, uh, and in 1976, in, in that, our district, it included all of Gwinnett County, uh, all of uh, Whitfield County on the west side. We went east to the South Carolina line, north to the North Carolina and Tennessee line. So we really had everything in North Georgia uh, in the 9th district. It's a very uh, sparsely populated area outside of uh, Gwinnett and Cherokee and Hall. But uh, I thought at the time that I could probably run a campaign for about $75,000. Uh, it ended up that uh, it cost about $130,000 and most of that was money that I contributed, borrowed, and uh, donated to the committee. But there were eight of us in that uh, campaign for on the Democratic side and, uh, and one person on the Republican side. And it was a very spirited campaign. It uh, went on for uh, several months because uh, I, I just left the law office and traveled the district for the next uh, eight months, seven or eight months. And ended up with a runoff with Senator Al Minish from over in Commerce, uh, Jackson County, and uh, was successful in that. But there were, uh, it, was a, it was a tough decision for me because I did have a good country law practice and, uh, and enjoyed it, but I, I did want to go to Congress because I'd had a little taste of it uh, with Phil. Well, having Congressman Landrum as a friend certainly must have helped you when you got to Washington. It did, uh, very much so. Uh, I knew the, some of the people 
in the house from having been a staffer there a few years before, one of whom was uh, Dan Rosinkowski from Chicago. He had been a young congressman at the time, uh, very active, and I knew him. He was a friend of Phil's. And uh, I decided to try to make a, a, a run for the Ways and Means Committee as a freshman. And uh, the way that operates uh, is that each party, Democrat and a Republican, they have a committee called a Committee on Committees uh, that, that nominate people for committee slots. And it's always extremely competitive. And uh, the Ways and Means and the Appropriations Committees are the two committees that are exclusive committees. That is, if you serve on one, you can't serve on another committee. Uh, but uh, I felt that this, the Ways and Means Committee was where I would have the greatest uh, opportunity to influence national legislation. And I ran for it, and uh, through uh, a couple of Phil's friends, including Dan Rostenkowski, who supported me as a freshman, he was on the committee, and uh, a couple of people from the Texas uh, state uh, that were supportive of me, I was able to get the nomination from the uh, Steering and Policy Committee for a vacancy on the committee. And uh, then I was contested in the caucus, in the full caucus, by a member who had been there about six or eight years. And by that time, I had put together, though, uh, a rather interesting coalition of Chamber of Commerce types very conservative with some labor support uh, that felt that I would be independent. That came from Rosinkowski primarily. And I was able to prevail in a very close election. Well, that committee had some very serious responsibilities, writing tax law, overseeing Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and, and other uh, types of federal it program. It had, Seems that should be in a full-time job. It, it, it really is. Uh, with I served on the trade subcommittee of Ways and Means Committee. And uh, when I indicated that the, it's an exclusive committee that you can't serve on any other committee, there is one committee that, uh, the budget committee, that is made up of uh, one representative from Ways and Means from the Democratic side, one from the Republican side, and then the others are uh, appointed by the Speaker, basically. But I also served on the Budget Committee for two terms while I was on the Ways and Means Committee. But uh, my subcommittee appointment, uh, while I had more than one through the, my 16 years, uh, the one committee that I stayed on, the longest subcommittee, was Trade which I had uh, wanted to serve on primarily because my district, congressional district at that time, the primary industry was in the textile field. And I felt uh, that I needed to protect domestic textile industry for a variety of counties from Jackson County, Barrow County, Hall County, uh, up in the mountains in, in uh, Rayburn County, and uh, a, a lot of small shops in addition to uh, Whitfield County, which was the carpet industry of the world, really. So I spent most of my time on that, uh, on Ways and Means Committee, on the Trade Subcommittee. And later became chair chairman for s several years of the Textile Caucus. Uh, which I didn't make many friends in the free trade area, but I, uh, I, I looked after the textile industry. And sponsored legislation. Uh, many pieces of legislation dealing with the textile industry. Uh, some that became law, but some that were vetoed and never became law. Well, let's talk about the, that, that legislation was in 1985. 
uh, when you uh, introduced it uh, uh, with opposition from your committee chairman, as I recall. And uh, later, uh, you passed legislation that was vetoed by the president. That's right. Uh, what was your reaction to that? Well, this was a long-fought battle. I was attempting in this piece of legislation to, uh, to establish some quotas from the cheap labor countries that were exporting to us uh, a lot of textiles. And I, I knew that the textile industry could not survive if that prevailed. So uh, my uh, piece of legislation would have slowed that down and uh, by establishing quotas. My subcommittee chairman, Sam Gibbons of Florida, was adamantly opposed uh, because he was uh, he was uh, a free trader and uh, did a good job in that field. Rosinkowski was opposed, as was the uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, so I had, uh, the only thing I had was a majority in the House, <laughs> which I could override them uh, and prevail, which I did and I uh, was able to uh, get it passed in the Senate and it went to President Reagan and he uh, vetoed it as I knew that he would. And uh, when it came back to the House as the sponsor of the bill, I did something that was a little bit unusual. Instead of having an immediate override vote which I knew that I could not win uh, because I couldn't get two-thirds of the House. I checked with a parliamentarian in, uh, about a specific date for an override, and he said, yes, you can do that. So uh, I asked for, and they didn't really realize, I don't think on the Republican side, what was happening, I asked for an October date, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> at any rate, fairly close to the election in November. <laughs> and, uh, and we had an interesting override vote, but it couldn't get out of the Senate, uh, which I knew. But it was a good uh, piece of legislation, and the follow-up on that, even though it probably went a bit too far uh, than even I would have preferred uh, in, in the ideal world, it would have saved, postponed the demise of the textile industry. Uh, and as you know today, of course, we, we don't have a textile industry to amount to anything in, in the entire state or in the country. You think we can ever bring it back? I'm somewhat doubtful. Uh, I think uh, the primary objective today ought to be to try to preserve some manufacturing regardless of what it is in. Uh, because I, I think it is a mistake for a nation to lose its manufacturing base. Uh, we're fast doing that. And, uh, a lot of it has to do with the value of the dollar, uh, which is very low today. That impacts us uh, adversely. And uh, it helps us in exports, but it, it doesn't help us domestically uh, a great deal in, with domestic industry. But I'm doubtful that the textile, uh, certainly the garment industry will not come back. The, the rest of the textile industry could survive parts of it, certainly carpet can. Mm -hmm. How about poultry, which is big poultry in was your district? Poultry uh, was and is a big thing in our district. Uh, we had several major poultry operations uh, throughout the mountain counties, and a lot of uh, it really, that, that industry really helped the standard of living of uh, the mountain people because people could grow poultry 
chickens. And at the same time, uh, operate at home. And uh, both the, the husband and the wife many times uh, worked within the poultry industry. And that gave a lot of income to uh, a world of people in the mountains. And uh, in addition to the processing plants that operated out of Hall, well, Hall, uh, Habersham, several counties. Uh, but it was a, it's a wonderful uh, area of employment, and it still is, uh, is in the, within the district now. There was a coalition of congressmen, mostly from the South, known as Blue Dogs. Were you a Blue Dog? No, I was not a Blue Dog, although I probably voted with the Blue Dog uh, group a great deal. The Blue Dogs were, were and are an extremely conservative group of Democrats, which I was also a conservative Democrat. But uh, very honestly, I, there were some things that, uh, while I was conservative on the budget, uh, on spending, there were some things that uh, I disagreed with them on, and uh, I didn't take an active uh, part in that. But they, they, they are in existence today, and as a matter of fact, uh, ha, have, a, have increased their numbers in the House. And they do a good job in trying to bring moderation to spending bills primarily. Let me read uh, to you a quote that I just read the other day. Someone said, uh, according to my records, Jenkins has not made a single speech in favor of increasing the federal deficit, raising taxes, or adjourning the army. <laughs> so it seems to me that you had a reputation of being a pay-as-you-go, lower taxes, strong defense member of the Congress. No question. Uh, I certainly, uh, all of that is true. Uh, I'm a great believer in a balanced budget on the federal level unless there is an unforeseen emergency such as a war that causes uh, one to, to uh, deficit spend. And even there, I agree, uh, like Lyndon Johnson, when he imposed the surtax uh, during the Vietnam War and to pay for it. I think this nation today is on the precipice of a very, very difficult time financially. That it could, it could weaken us severely. And I believe that when I served, uh, I, I believe that it was important that we not uh, overspend. So many times I would vote against a, a spending program that I may, may have believed in simply because I thought it cost too much money at the time. And uh, being on the budget committee, uh, I saw a lot of areas that I felt there could be a reduction in spending. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was on the committee, Barbara Conable, a Republican member from New York, who later became president of the World Bank after he left the Ways and Means Committee. He was the ranking member on the, on the Ways and Means Committee on the Republican side. He also felt much like I did on spending. And he and I uh, sponsored a balanced, it was called the Balance the Budget Committee uh, bill and passed it in, in the House, it did not get out of the Senate, but while it would not have mandated a balanced budget every year, it would have provided that you could not increase spending more than the increase in the, uh, the national increase of uh, monetary capacity, so that you'd have probably on any year you'd have three or four percent more that you could spend than you did uh, the previous year. It would, have, it would have brought us into a balanced budget over a period of time. 
And I still believe today that uh, we, we really have a problem right now with uh, overspending. As far as the military is concerned, uh, uh, when I went there, uh, there had been, uh, for the first three or four years of my service, there had been a great decrease in uh, military spending. I felt that it was important that we had to increase military preparedness and therefore the military budget had to be increased and, and I was a supporter of that. As I recall, you served under three speakers. That's correct. Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts. Yes. Jim Wright from yes. Texas and uh, Tom Foley from Washington. Washington. Yeah. Tell us a little about a congressman's relationship with the speaker. Well, uh, when I went there in 77, that was the first year that uh, Tip O'Neill commenced to serve as speaker. He was elected during the same, during my freshman year. And uh, you got to know a speaker a little bit better when, when he was up for election, if he had not served before, because normally if they've been in office a while, uh, the freshman members don't get to associate too much with the speaker. But uh, I got to know Tip O'Neill once again through uh, Dan Rostenkowski more than anybody else because I went on Ways and Means Committee and Tip did not support me for Ways and Means Committee and he was the incoming speaker. Uh, so I had defeated him <laughs> uh, in going on the committee. But I liked Tip O'Neill, even though he was a very liberal member, he was really a labor-oriented, uh, from his district in Boston, was a very heavily uh, labor-intensive district. And uh, labor unions, uh, he rarely went against uh, what the labor unions wanted. But Tip was a Irish, uh, good, uh, jovial person and uh, could make friends with anyone. And he had a great relationship with uh, the Republican minority leader at that time, uh, Bob Michaels from uh, Illinois. And, uh, and many times he would call me during his tenure, uh, 10 years as speaker, I believe it was 10 years, on major bills to see how I felt the South would go. And I'd give him a read. That's normally what the whip did, but sometimes he would call me. So I got to know him because I, I supported some things that he was for, but I opposed a lot of things that he was for. And he, I, I think there was a, a degree of respect on both sides. And he would sometimes uh, eat out with the uh, there were about five of us, six of us, that ate out on Tuesday night, sometimes more than that. But the so-called Tuesday night crowd, and Tip would be a part of that. And I was uh, the token Southerner, I guess, on that, in that group. Uh, which incidentally, a lot of that group have gone on to the Senate. Uh, one of them was Barbara Boxer, and one was uh, Chuck Schumer from New York. And uh, Rosty, and myself, occasionally not too often, but occasionally Tip, uh, and uh, John Lewis occasionally would join that uh, group when he came to the house. But uh, I got along, and the average uh, member, I think, uh, from both sides, uh, liked Tip O'Neill. When uh, Jim Wright was elected after Tip had left, retired, this had been a very contentious election each time uh, that Jim Wright, uh, Jim was elected majority leader by one vote in, in 1977. And uh, his opponent at that time had been 
Philip Burton, Congressman Burton from uh, California, who was a more liberal member. And there were two other people also running that were eliminated before the ultimate runoff. But uh, Jim Wright won by one vote. And uh, from Texas, he had been chairman of a committee in the House and uh, had made a lot of friends from both sides of the aisle, but he had more support from the moderate to conservative group because the liberals had gone with Phil Burton. And uh, when he became speaker, he had some opposition from within the party. Some people who were not too fond of him. Jim Wright was a very uh, scrappy guy and uh, a lot of people didn't know it, but he had been a, a, a pretty good boxer in the Navy, I believe, military. And uh, he didn't mind to mix it up with you. <laughs> and he did occasionally with some people uh, that almost came to fisticuffs a time or two. But about the same time, Congressman Newt Gingrich had come to the House and uh, he put a different flavor on the Republican side, in my view. Uh, first of all, Newt Gingrich is a very able fellow, a very good speaker and a sharp mind, but it, uh, not one of my favorites uh, at all because I, I never felt that he was the most, uh, that he was, he would not stay where he said he, he would be. <laughs> He was sort of an opportunist at times, in my view. But at any rate, he organized the House Republicans and uh, was moving Michael out of, gradually, out of uh, office as the minority leader. He did this in several ways. First of all, he was very conservative and he, he grouped the conservatives on the Republican side together and uh, they stuck together, and they, uh, they liked Gingrich because he did have a lot of ideas. He's a brilliant guy in so many ways. Uh, but the most important thing, I think, of his rise to power in addition to his own abilities uh, was the practice of televising the House chamber. That happened under Tip O'Neill's, uh, when he was speaker. And Congressman Gingrich, in my view, saw the, the importance of this from a political standpoint. And at the end of a session, you always had uh, the opportunity to have time on the House floor. Uh, with CNN uh, televising the House chamber, he would organize speeches by himself and others on any particular subject and speak every day. And he became nationally known from doing that. And it was a, it was a ingenious uh, type of uh, operation that they had and they organized and they'd have a certain group every day to do this. And then he decided to go after Jim Wright and every day there would be an attack on Wright, mm -hmm. speaker, for any personal defects or any failures or anything and finally drove him out of office. Uh, because, and out of Congress. And out of Congress. Uh, and uh, so I would say that Jim Wright's uh, service was more contentious and more controversial uh, from within and, with, and outside the party. I liked Jim Wright uh, myself, got along with him. I, I had differences with him too, but uh, we had mutual respect. And he's still in Texas today, incidentally. He's, he's not in good health. 
Tom Foley was a more of a peacemaker, and uh, he was not a strong leader. Uh, was not a. He got along more with with both sides. He had been chairman of the Agriculture Committee in the House, and uh, a lot of Southerners liked him very much. Who are some of your colleagues uh, from Georgia? Bo Ginn from down in Savannah, uh, who had uh, also worked on the Hill at the same time I had. He had worked for Talmadge, and before that he had worked for a House member, but I knew Bo from from years ago. And he was on Appropriations Committee and did a fine job for, for the state uh, because he was important in, in getting projects through and funded. Uh, so he, uh, I knew him real well. Dawson Mathis from down in Albany uh, was a, a very good member. He also was on the Agriculture Committee, but he was close to Phil Burton, uh, the, the liberal member from California, even though Dawson was extremely conservative. But they were good allies. And Dawson served as our uh, steering and policy member that named members to various committees. Every state had a, every zone had a member. And he was on the committee when, uh, steering policy committee when I became a member of the Ways and Means Committee and he was very important to me. Doug Bernard from Augusta served uh, with me for many years. He was on banking committee, did a fine job there. Buddy Darden came after uh, uh, after I had been there a couple of three years uh, from Marietta and he was on the Armed Services Committee and was a well-liked member of the House. Uh, did, a, did a fine job, I think, uh, for, for his district and for the state. Uh, Jack Brinkley from Columbus was there for, for a couple of terms before he retired. He incidentally was a, a friend of mine from Young Harris College days. He had finished a couple of years before me at Young Harris. And uh, I knew him from, from there. And he was a very outstanding person. Uh, morality of the highest degree, very honest guy. I thought a lot of him. Uh, he still lives in Columbus now, I think, or in that area. Who have I left out? Uh, Jack Flint was there when I first went there. Jack is now deceased, but uh, he uh, chaired the Ethics Committee at one time. Incidentally, I also served on the Ethics Committee. I, they say you, you have to serve a sentence on the Ethics Committee. I served two terms on the Ethics Committee. But uh, Jack Flint at one time was a uh, chair of that committee, I think. He was also on uh, Appropriations Committee. Speaking of the Ethics Committee, uh, several incidents occurred in Washington while you were in Congress. One was Korea Gate, one was Iran Gate. Right. And uh, tell us about those. Well, the Korea Gate Thing. I was not on the committee at the time, on the ethics committee at that time, but uh, that had to do with some alleged briberies of members of the House uh, by a Korean supporter for Korea in the military field. And uh, they would, uh, the undercover FBI sting operation uh, offered money to several of these members from both sides of the aisle and uh, there were about three or four if I remember correctly maybe more that were later indicted for bribery or attempted bribery and were either expelled from the House 
and later tried in their districts. Uh, some of them either pled guilty or were convicted. Uh, one of the uh, areas uh, when I was on the Ethics Committee that came up was the Page scandal. Uh, there were, as you know, we have at that time we had a Page dormitory more or less, where all of the pages lived. And these could be anywhere, and they were normally 17, 16, 17, 18, could be 19 year old kids uh, that were pages. And uh, there was very lax supervision uh, of the pages. There, the, You did have a couple of members that were, uh, committees that were oversight, uh, had oversight responsibility, but it was not very good and not very active. And uh, a couple of these pages had had affairs with, or allegedly had affairs with a uh, member of Congress. And uh, that was brought up uh, while I was on the committee. One of them had to do with a uh, Republican member from the state of Illinois and a 17 or 18 year old Page, uh, both of whom admitted and was uh, uh, chastised by the House, not the girl, she'd already left. She was one of the things that hindered that investigation incidentally. It had happened several years before and she was a uh, housewife and mother and didn't want anything, uh, obviously didn't want any publicity. But the member was charged and uh, he lost his election that year because of that. Also there was a gay member that had an affair uh, and that person was likewise uh, chastised by the House in the same manner that the, the Republican member had been with the female. That uh, brought about great changes in the page system, which was, which was really needed. And uh, greater supervision and oversight, and that's good. The other thing that came up, I guess, during uh, that time that I was on the committee was the so-called bank uh, it really wasn't a uh, fraudulent thing. What happened was that the House has a bank and the Senate has a bank. And most members would have their salary check uh, automatically uh, deposited each month in that bank. Uh, and if you overdrafted, uh, there was not a great deal of care because they knew the check would be coming the at next payday. So a lot of members that had financial difficulties made a practice of overdrawing their account. And uh, the FBI was brought in once again to uh, check every member and uh, their accounts to see if they'd ever over <laughs> overdrafted. Fortunately, when, when the FBI came to me and said, you have never overdrawn, I said, put it in writing. <laughs> Give me a letter, <laughs> which they did. But, but that hurt a lot of members of Congress. And it really wasn't that uh, much of a breach. It was a breach, but it wasn't as severe it was, as it was uh, publicized. And the uh, Iran-Contra Committee letter, you mentioned Iran-Gate. Now you you were you were appointed to that what special committee by Jim Wright. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the speaker made the appointments to investigative committees, and, and uh, the senators were appointed likewise by the leader in the Senate. But uh, Jim Wright was speaker when Iran. Contra conflict came up, and he appointed uh, Peter Rodino, who had been 
active, of course, in the uh, Watergate years before. He named him as chair. And then he named subcommittee or committee chairman to that committee from the Democratic side. And uh, you had uh, almost every standing committee chairman, such as Jack Brooks, who was chairman of, of uh, banking, I guess, at that time. Uh, Lee Hamilton, a uh, Democrat from Indiana, and a host of others. Uh, and he called me one day, the speaker called me and said, I want you to serve on Iran-Contra. And I happened to be speaking in, in Georgia at the time when he reached me down in Marietta. And I said, well, Mr. Speaker, I hadn't even thought about this because I've never, I've never asked for it. And he said, I know you have it. You're probably the only Democrat that hasn't asked. <laughs> but he said, I want you, because of your uh, background as a trial lawyer, uh, and he named me to that committee. It's a fascinating committee. Uh, there were a lot of things involved uh, that were that were not right. That had uh, Reagan had reached the point, in my view, uh, there were some vacancies because of retiring people over in the National Security Council as well as Secretary of State. Uh, Schultz had come on as Secretary of State, uh, and he didn't totally have a grasp of everything because uh, he didn't know everything that was going on. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, a young lieutenant colonel by the name of Ollie North was in the Senate, I mean in the, in the White House as a young staffer, more or less, and he saw that there was a vacuum out there, and he was uh, very active in the Contra at that time conflict. And the House had been curtailing expenditures in Central America. Did not believe that uh, it was proper. I had been on the opposite side and had been supportive of Reagan in the fight against the Contras. Uh, but, the House, the law was that you couldn't do it. And really there was a, a way to circumvent it, not legal, but uh, nevertheless, Ollie saw the opportunity that we could uh, make some money, or they could make some money by selling some uh, weapons to Iran through Israel. And uh, they did that. And they would charge Iran more than what they really cost, what the Israel was paying us for them. And uh, they'd take that extra money and use it in, in sending it to the Contras in Central America. All illegal. And uh, Ali was... Uh, one of the real operatives in that because uh, he, he, he pretended, told everybody in the White House that the, the old man, the president, was asking him to, to do these things, which there was no truth to that, I don't think. Uh, at least we didn't find that Reagan had specifically told him. Reagan later said that he was aware if you recall, that uh, some money was being spent there. But at any rate, the investigation went on for months. Dick Cheney, incidentally, was on the committee from the Republican side. So I had an interesting group and uh, from the Senate, George Mitchell, to give you a little interesting uh, sidebar comment, they, we would select people that we would cross-examine. There were like 50 or 60 members, and I had selected, uh, uh, being the freshman, the only non-chairman on, on the committee, I selected last, of course, from the Democratic side. So everyone already had the 
Secretary of the uh, Defense and Secretary of State and the Under Secretary of State and Ali and all of the others. But uh, Ali had a wonderful lawyer by the name of Sullivan. And uh, he'd have Ali in his full uniform every day at attention. And he became uh, a sympathetic hero to the American people because they watched it every day. And the Congress, this committee, became uh, scapegoats, more or less, because we were attacking this wonderful guy. And uh, George Mitchell was going to be the person to cross-examine from the Senate, and one of the older members, the chairman of one of the committees, was going to be the cross-examiner from our side. And on Thursday, before Ollie was to report on Monday, the Democratic caucus met and said, we believe uh, that Jenkins would do better <laughs> to cross-examine Ollie North than the one who had selected him. Now, they told me this and wanted me to do it. I said, well, fellas, first of all, I understand what's going on. Y'all are running for cover. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I, I want you to know that first and foremost, I understand the process, and you want me to be from the House side, but I said, I will do it, even though I haven't uh, concentrated upon his particular area uh, of, uh, of what he did. I shall never forget, I rented a place at Jekyll Island that weekend, one of those houses, and I took all of these... Uh, uh, transcripts, which are volumes, and, and tried to go through before Monday when I flew back to Washington. But George Mitchell and I then cross-examined Ollie, and I, I, I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, a lot was not uh, discovered, I guess, during that uh, cross-examination. Although I, I did ask this series of questions of Ollie, which uh, really made Brendan uh, Sullivan upset, I asked Ollie, I said, you know I've uh, supported the Contra aid, as you have, and he said, oh, I know that. They had, they had done a good job on researching me. <laughs> uh, I said, but of course I believe that we ought to uh, follow the law. And, uh, I said, now, no, uh, the speaker didn't know, speaker of the House, my speaker, or uh, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee on the House side, didn't know anything about the supply of money to the Contras or this program that you had. And he said, no. I said, did the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee know about it or anybody in the Senate? And he said, no, we kept that uh, because we didn't want it to get out, obviously. And uh, I said, what about Vice President Bush? Did, did he know about it? And he said, no. I said, did the Secretary of State know about it? He said, no. I said, what about the President? Did the President know about it? <laughs> and Ollie said, well, I thought he did at the time. But I discovered since then that he probably did not know all the details. And I said, well, are you telling the, this committee and American people that not a single elected official of the United States of America knew what y'all were doing? <laughs> he says, well, I guess not. <laughs> Words to that effect. But at any rate, the committee, as you know, made uh, recommendations. We did not seek a lot of people from the staff level and also a lot of people uh, that were anti-Reagan really wanted to go after the president in the, an impeachment process because of this. But the committee, the Democrats, uh, which controlled the committee at that time, we felt that that would be a mistake. Uh, we had just been through a Watergate uh, in the early 70s. 71, 72, 73, through that uh, Nixon impeachment. And uh, very honestly, the committee on both the Democrat and the Republican side felt 
that uh, the country couldn't withstand another impeachment process at, at that particular time, and I think that was correct. We failed to mention the fact that you went to Congress the year Jimmy Carter was elected president. Uh, that's correct. and. Uh, Jimmy Carter was, uh, had, had a lot of difficulties uh, with some of the staff. Good people, but in my view, some of them were, were probably not uh, given the position, the right position at the time. And, uh, and he had a lot of difficulties with the Congress, uh, with his own party in the Congress. Uh, if you recall, of course, he had sort of run against the establishment, and, uh, and uh, that had alienated, I guess, some people. But he was never close to anybody on the House side, or to my, uh, even the Senate. He had a lot of legislation, obviously, that came before the Ways and Means Committee. Some of it very good legislation, uh, and I, as a member from Georgia, attempted to help him uh, with some of that, even though it was more liberal maybe in some areas than I wanted it to be. But he did see a lot of uh, problems, for instance, uh, on, on the medical side. He had a hospital cost containment bill uh, that was very controversial, uh, but passed out of the committee by very close vote, one vote, I think, uh, which I supported him on, even though it had some provisions that I didn't like. It was killed in the House, full House. He had an energy bill that was uh, geared primarily toward conservation and uh, mandates uh, as to uh, surtaxes on large automobiles. Uh, that was in 1978, I believe. And he had a world of uh, legislation dealing with, uh, with trade and with uh, taxes generally. Uh, I didn't support the, a lot of the tax measures because uh, I really believed that uh, the tax schedules were too high at the time. As a matter of fact, uh, if you recall, after he left office, uh, I led the group that reduced capital gains taxes. And uh, while I think there is certainly a, a, an argument for capital gains taxes being of some kind, I didn't, you know, there is a, huge number of people, large number of people that don't believe there should be any tax on capital gains. Uh, I felt that the tax rate at the time was much too high and should be reduced to attract uh, more industry and more capital to this country. But Jimmy Carter had a tough time as president uh, with legislation. He, he didn't have the right uh, sponsorship, if you will, in the Senate or in the House with most of his legislation. And it was very difficult to get it passed. He was not close to Tip O'Neill as Speaker. Uh, he was not uh, close to many of the committee chairmen. And uh, there was little effort made, in my view, to, uh, to make allies out of them rather than opponents. And he didn't have support from the South, strangely enough, uh, that he needed in, in uh, most of his legislative uh, proposals. So it's fair to assume that if you run for president as an outsider, when you get to Washington, you well may become an outsider. I think so. You need to deal, you need to know how to deal uh, with the legislative branch. And uh, if you don't, uh, you won't accomplish much. Let's talk for a minute about the first Gulf War. You were a member 
uh, of the Congress when that war came about. And if I'm correct, you voted against funding that war. I did. I voted against the resolution uh, to go to war. Actually, it was, it was what was used to go to war. Uh, I've never been totally convinced that that conflict with uh, Iraq, uh, it was a lot about oil in my view. Now, there can be no question uh, that it was also about human rights and, and the conflict there with, uh, with the neighbors of Iraq. But I felt that we, since we had been supporting Iraq in its war against Iran with some weapon systems and some money through the years, that to turn around and suddenly uh, attack Iraq because it was threatening Kuwait was not uh, justified as an all-out war. I've been very cautious during my uh, tenure as to, as to looking after the United States of America, but to stay out of a lot of conflicts in the Middle East. And uh, therefore I opposed it, as did Sam Nunn, incidentally, mm -hmm. you know, over on the Senate side. On the House side, uh, and Sam was chairman of the uh, Armed Services Committee in the Senate. Uh, he's, he's like me, he's not absolutely 100% certain that it was the right vote, but uh, it was the right vote as far as I was concerned with me intellectually. I just didn't see, uh, well, f first of all, I, I, I didn't think that we would attack and then withdraw. Uh, I figured that we would go all out in Iraq, and uh, which we did not, as you know. We just uh, defeated them and turned them back. I uh, think my thought process was correct as to the dangers of going into Iraq as we have under this administration and the turmoil that it has created and the money that we have spent uh, and we still are not uh, certain as to whether or not we we were correct. So in that war, uh, besides showing a uh, awesome display of military power, we actually didn't accomplish much. No, I don't think so. We saved Kuwait, and I guess the oil uh, there, which we are somewhat dependent upon. Uh, so there's some positives and some negatives. But I had been to, uh, I had traveled some to Pakistan and to Afghanistan primarily with Charlie Wilson, who was uh, <laughs> become a little bit infamous in the last few years uh, with the book and the movie. But uh, I had met a lot of the Taliban in Pakistan, in Islamabad, and in Afghanistan. And very honestly, I was never convinced that you could depend upon uh, these people. It appeared to me that we were pouring a lot of money. That's, uh, that's at the time that they were fighting the Soviet Union. And of course, w we wanted them to prevail against the Soviet Union, and Charlie in particular, Charlie Wilson, uh, was responsible for them getting the Stinger missiles that helped defeat the uh, Russian army. But there was more to it than that. Uh, these people were being funded with a lot of money from America. And uh, you had to deal with these feudal lords out there. And in my view, it was like uh, trying to buy votes, you know, in some election. You didn't know whether they were stayed with you or not. So it, it, was, it just defeated 
its purpose in trying to finance a war in that part of the world when you didn't know the culture or the mindset of those people. And uh, like Alexander the Great that came over uh, into Afghanistan, he didn't stay long, he just passed on through. I think that's what we needed to do. I don't think we needed to stay long. Do you think it was a mistake for us to invade Afghanistan in recent times? I think now there is more of a reason for concentrating in Afghanistan. Uh, it is a uh, truly a uh, a place that uh, will be difficult. And I don't know that we ought to uh, get too involved more than we are now uh, because I don't know, like uh, Iraq, I don't know how easy it will be to get out of there. Uh, Soviets found that was very difficult and uh, you, you almost have to fight a, a war from a distance when you do these things. You need to. If you're going to do that, you need to finance one side or the other, whichever is your uh, friends, so-called friends, and let them do most of the fighting. Had you been in Congress when the decision was made, would you have supported uh, the Bush invasion of Iraq? No, I would not have. I would have voted against it. I would have voted against it. Uh, as I did in the first uh, Gulf War. What do you make of our presence there? I think it has brought us to a financial crisis. Uh, not that in and of itself, but uh, together with uh, spending in addition to that war. And it has destroyed the value of the dollar. Uh, we are at a real crisis right now, in my view, as to whether or not we can can live without real inflation that comes as a result of this overspending. Furthermore, uh, we obviously did not do a good job in in fighting the war if, if we had toppled Saddam and then left at the appropriate time, turning it over to, <coughs> to some of the local anti-Saddam people, we would have been better off. Or in the alternative, if they would have really increased uh, the number of troops as some on both sides of the political aisle say that we should have in the beginning, uh, we, we would have been better off. But to uh, turn loose uh, Saddam's army and say we no longer 400,000 troops and, and uh, say you no longer have a job and they've got to turn them loose in the country with their arms, uh, they obviously are going to belong to an insurgency group that's going to give us problems as they have. But it's looking better now, I think, uh, since they did increase in the last year, uh, our presence there, I think it is looking much better than it has, but I wouldn't depend upon that long term. Are we overreacting to the threat of terrorism? Well, it's hard to say. I think it's a, uh, obviously, since the 9-11 catastrophe, it, it has become something that we have to deal with. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, I, don't, I think we have to really know what's going on uh, with people coming here. You have to have intelligence and you have to spend a lot of money in that area. And uh, 
I disagree with some in my party on uh, on uh, recent legislation dealing with uh, with eavesdropping and so forth on foreign calls. Uh, I don't think that we ought to have to have a as much uh, intelligence to do that as you would in making a uh, search of an American home or anything like that. Uh, you know, the argument goes that uh, in, in being a, having been a defense attorney as well as a prosecutor, I, I understand uh, the use of, uh, of our laws properly, but, uh, and the, their argument always is, it's better to let one guilty person go than it is to, uh, to convict an innocent person. But uh, when you're talking about a terrorist, in my view, it's not right to let, to say it's all right for one terrorist to, to get by, to get through, uh, rather than to uh, illegally search, if you will, a lot of tr calls from foreign countries or to foreign countries. I don't, I don't think you can go that far. I think if you let one terrorist through, uh, that's one too many. That, that could be a real danger to the country. So I say uh, have tough legislation authorizing uh, telephone uh, calls and so forth to foreign countries. Seems to me that all of these uh, engagements that we find ourselves in around the world point toward lack of stability in our foreign policy seems that uh, that Congress has a role and the president has a role, the administration has a role. How do you merge those two into a specific attitude toward our role in world affairs? There has to be more respect, first of all, less partisanship when it comes to the committees that have jurisdiction. Uh, Years ago, you did have that, uh, I think, in foreign affairs, you know, in the Dick Russell days and, and uh, Senator George, uh, from Georgia I'm talking about specifically. Uh, they would sit down with whomever is the president on matters of foreign affairs. They would oppose them on other things, domestic, if they felt like it, but they would try to adopt a policy that uh, would be in the best interest of the country and, and join together in doing that. We haven't done that in some time. Uh, there has to be more respect for, for uh, the presidency and uh, the Secretary of State's job as well as uh, respect for the intelligence committees in the Senate and in the House. That's very difficult to do in today's uh, uh, political atmosphere. But it's it partisan, to be. Yes, partisan it atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask this question, if I may. Uh, how much support do you think that, uh, that we should provide to opposition forces in these places like El Salvador and, and uh, Iraq and Iran? Uh, I think it's very dangerous. Uh, the entanglements that uh, develop, because you, you're not absolutely certain, nor is our CIA always, uh, as to the support that these people have. Uh, there, there are occasions when that is needed, but as a general policy, I think we make a mistake in supporting every uh, group that may be anti-government uh, in their country. Uh, I, I think that's a dangerous route to go, and I'd be very careful about doing that. Let's talk about some Georgia politics. The Republican Party has taken over now the governor's office and the state legislature for the first time in what, 100 years yep. or more? Yep. Uh, what do you think is the reason for that? 
Well, I think that there are three or four issues that uh, that occurred uh, that made the Democratic Party somewhat weak that trans that then came on down to the state level. First of all, we've always been in the South a conservative people. Uh, we have experienced defeat and had to sort of shuffle for ourselves as a region. And uh, therefore probably became a little bit introverted, if you will, since Civil War days. And being a conservative uh, area with conservative ideas, not enough money to spend as other areas, uh, other states had, uh, we had to be against a lot of spending proposals in our state. But also from a social standpoint, uh, three or four issues I think that work to the Republican advantage and to the disadvantage of the Democrats. Uh, the abortion issue, uh, we have been basically pro-life throughout the South. We're, we're uh, primarily Protestant, conservative Protestant areas. I think the gay issue uh, worked to the advantage of the Republican side and uh, to the disadvantage of uh, of our culture, if you will. I think on the racial side, the affirmative action uh, legislation and uh, proposals did not uh, set well with uh, the conservative people. I think all of those work to the disadvantage uh, of the Democratic Party. Human rights has always been uh, more of a Democratic Party issue than the Republican Party since the Civil War. Prior to that, it was the Republican uh, that, that were more supportive of uh, certainly uh, racial rights. But uh, in recent times, I think that the abortion, the gay, uh, the affirmative action, uh, did not uh, owed well in any of the southern states. And a lot of other issues too that came along, although the uh, uh, Republican Party did a better job than we did in uh, organizing at the grassroots level. And uh, they really did a fine job in taking advantage of computers and computer lists and that type of thing much before the Democrats did. Many disenchanted Democrats uh, feel that the state party uh, is too urban and too controlled by minorities and labor unions. Uh, do you agree with that? I think that has played a role uh, certainly, in uh, in recent years, uh, once again that uh, somewhat plays into to what I was talking about. Uh, if if the base of the Democratic Party in our state is the African American community, and uh, while that is very important for us in state elections. It also has a downside in uh, the rural areas in particular because they say, are you with the Afri are you with the blacks? Or are you with the, that's basically what you hear out in the country. And that has been very difficult for us to overcome. And I think that there ought to be a, a real effort made in the rural areas and the white communities because 
really, from an economic standpoint, uh, all of those people, or most of those people, if you leave the social out for a minute and just look at it economic uh, basis, most of those people ought to be Democrats, in my view. Because in the Congress, here is what I would find in the Ways and Means Committee as well as on the House floor. If you had a fight on taxes, you would find that the Democrat Party members from all over the country were more for the people making $50,000 a year or less. Whereas invariably, the Republican side in argument would be more for the investment side, which is the higher income side. Now there's it's on both sides, and sometimes there are deviations from, from each of those. But generally, uh, you would find the Democratic side more for the 50,000 and below, where most of the country people in Georgia are. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So from an economic standpoint, that's uh, where we have fallen down. We haven't uh, promoted that as well as we should. Now we've made mistakes on the social side, the uh, Democratic Party, and the racial side. But, uh, but I, think, uh, I think we really need to take the state party and infuse it with a lot of uh, the people out in the rural areas. Uh, many states require party registration. We don't do that in Georgia. Should we? I have tossed that around for a long time in my mind. Uh, I, I have a hesitancy to do that even though I vote in the Democratic primary and therefore I don't get to vote for my local uh, Republican leaders. <laughs> except in November, and there's generally, in my county, and generally not a Democrat running against a Republican. The, my local office, sheriff, commissioner, uh, every office in my county is Republican, uh, except for one. But, uh, but I, I tend to believe that uh, on a local level, you ought to have nonpartisan County offices, uh, and we used to do that in this county. We still do for one uh, one office. The uh, the probate judge always runs as, and always has. But we do that on the state level for superior court judges, and I think it's just as important that you have a nonpartisan uh, sheriff, nonpartisan county commission in these uh, small counties. But party registration, I, I, I'm i hesitant to say that uh, we ought to go to that. Some people support term, legisl uh, term limits on legislators as well as, as members of the Congress. What do you think about that? I have opposed term limits. Uh, Primarily because I think, especially in the Congress, uh, first of all, you'd have to have a legislative, uh, you'd have to have a constitutional amendment, because the only thing you have to be is a resident of the state and age requirement. Uh, you can you can live in South Georgia and run for Congress and up here in the mountains if you want to, uh, as long as you're a resident of the state uh, under the Constitution. So I think uh, while I can understand why you want to turn everybody out occasionally, uh, most of the people I find that are far term limits are far term limits until it applies to them and then, <laughs> and, and then they, uh, they say, well, I know I gave you a commitment to leave after six terms or seven terms, but uh, I've changed my mind now. I, I think it's the people ought to hold those people responsible <laughs> if they made a commitment to do to be for term limits and then renege on it. <laughs> but while we're on that subject of, of uh, party politics, uh, I want to ask you this question. 
What did you think of your friend Senator Zell Miller's decision to keynote the Republican National Convention <laughs> in 2004? I thought it was a mistake. Uh, he's my friend and, uh, and will be, but uh, I thought it was a mistake for him as a Democrat to keynote the National Republican Convention. That just goes against my grain. Uh, I am a Democrat, and until I decide to be otherwise, I'll fight within my party. Uh, I, I believe in the two-party system, even though that has been a, sometimes I think the parliamentary system in Great Britain is better than ours, but uh, being independent-minded as I am, uh, I still believe that this nation is better served with the two parties, and uh, I'm not a third party advocate, nor am I an advocate of uh, taking part in uh, the internal business of the opposite party. What was your toughest political campaign? The first campaign uh, in 77. I had uh, seven opponents in the Democratic primary, and uh, the, while I ran first in, in that campaign, uh, I had a runoff with Senator Minish from over in Jackson County, and I, I won that. And, and my second campaign was a rather difficult campaign because uh, one of the people who from Gwinnett County who was chairman of the uh, County Commission down there had run and lost. He, he, he was more or less projected to be the top guy in the first, my first race. That was Gunning, Ray Gunning. And uh, he felt that if he could get me one on one, he could prevail because he came from a large populated area and I had about. 15,000 people here in my county, uh, but I had all the mountain counties for me, and I had a pretty good uh, base in Hall County and Whitfield County, so uh, he did not, but that was a tough race. He, he ran a very good race. You know D.L. Crumley? D.L. Crumley. <laughs> you wouldn't, I, I have to ask you that question, Ed. <laughs> a great friend of mine, I'll have to tell you this story, because I want to, uh, people to know who D.L. Crumley. He no longer is alive. He's dead now. In my first race, I did not know a single person in Whitfield County, which at that time, Dalton area, which at that time had about 60,000 people. And I spent a lot of time over there during that year of campaigning, uh, outside the restaurants and inside the restaurants and various mills that I could get into, a lot of carpet mills. But it was, uh, there was a, young, a fellow running from over there, Alton Bridges, who was a good candidate and worked in a bank. And I, I knew that he would prevail in Whitfield County, but I wanted to run at least second. And I wanted to make sure that I could do well if I was in the runoff. So I handed out a lot of cards and uh, period of weeks and didn't seem to be making too much progress. And one day, someone up the sidewalk was at a fast gait running toward me hollering, Jenkins, Jenkins, Jenkins. And I looked and I saw this fellow coming and I suddenly recognized someone that I hadn't seen for 20 years, D.L. Crumley. I said, D.L. He was a fellow I played baseball with in Union County. He played third base. I played second on the town team, baseball team, and sort of grew up together. And he said, I have been looking for you. I've been wanting to get literature. He said, I said, D.L., you've come to the right place. I've got it in the trunk of my car. And he was a truck driver for Roadway Express. 
And he said, and he said, look, I umpire baseball games. I've got daughters playing basketball. I do some uh, refereeing of basketball games, and I go into every carpet mill, picking up carpet or bringing supplies from Ro uh, Roadway Express. Well, I unloaded all this literature on him. <laughs> Make a long story short, I did run second uh, with eight of us running primarily because of D.L. Crumley. And after I was, and I carried Whitfield County after that because the, their favorite candidate did not run, I mean did not place. And about a week after the general election, I get this call, this is 1976, from a carpet industry owner in Whitfield County that I recognized by name, and I saw that he had contributed to my opponent, uh, <laughs> and he said that he wanted to come over to see me with three other carpet mill owners about the natural gas shortage in 1977. He said, you, you're going to have a, a vote, and you can have some influence about getting us some priority to run our carpet mills. Otherwise, these people are going to be out of work. And I said, well, come on over. And they explained all this to me. It's very important. Your people up there have a job. And I said, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, I said, I think I will be 100% for the proposal that you make to me. But I want to know how what DL thinks about it. And uh, they looked at each other. Uh, this was in my little law office before I'd been sworn in. And finally, one of them said, now, D.L. who, uh, <laughs> Congressman? And I said, well, D.L. Crumley. And he said, well, what mill does he own up there? And I said, well, D.L. doesn't own a mill. He's a truck driver for Roadway Express, and he's my man in Whitfield County, and if you'll check with him, if it's all right with him, it'll be fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, D.L. called me about 11 o'clock that night, and he says, there's some big shots up here wanting to know something about a gas bill. I said, D.L., just stick with me, pal. You're going to be all right. <laughs> uh, that's well, that's a, the D.L. Crumley story. He was a, a, he was a great friend. That's a, a great story, and uh, <laughs> we need to hear more stories like that. Uh, Ed, uh, you've had a very sex successful career. And I know you're proud of your service, and I know the people you've served are proud of you. But looking back, if you could have done anything differently, what would you have done? I would have run for the Senate when Weich Fowler was elected. Weich was a good friend of mine. I don't serve on the committee with me. And I felt that there was an opportunity for a Democrat to, to win. And I thought that I was postured and had been asked by many people to run. Uh, that is one decision that I made not to, that I sort of regret, uh, even though I supported Watch and I thought he did a good job. Why, why didn't you run? Well, it had to do with a couple of things. Uh, First of all, I like Weich, and he is on my committee, and uh, we're good friends. Uh, and he'd gotten out early. And uh, then uh, there was one vote that I made that I thought was a bad vote, even though it was for my district, uh, probably at the time. I voted to uh, on the King birthday bill. I had voted to put the, the holiday, not on his birthday, but on the Sunday, uh, tr once again trying to save $600 million or whatever it was, uh, that businesses would not close and that you'd have it on a Sunday. That was uh, very distasteful to uh, the African American community. Uh, I felt that that would become a real issue 
which I had had the support of the African American community in my district, which was very small. Uh, but I thought that that could become an issue. They be hard to explain in terms that they would accept. And uh, if Weich was in it, uh, I would lose that block of votes. So it, I'd have been out in the uh, rural areas trying to prevail, and I knew it would be a tough, tough campaign. I think I could have won. That's uh, I might have should have made that decision. Why did you decide to retire? I had reached the point that I knew I had two children, wife here, that I'd been away a long time and uh, it was time for me. I was 60 years old. Uh, I didn't see the opportunity of becoming chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I had run for majority leader. Uh, and, and lost in a very close election in the House. Uh, Dick Gephardt uh, had defeated me, and uh, I had been there a couple of years later, three years, four years after that, and Rostinkowski at that time, he had told me, he a, <laughs> was a good ally of mine, he had told me that he was going to step down and that I could become chair if I'd make the right moves of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, to do that, I would have to jump over uh, three or four people, including Charlie Rangel, good friend of mine, Sam Gibbons from Florida, Pete Stark from California. I felt that I'd have no problem in in ultimately prevailing, uh, but I, that also would be somewhat divisive. But I had decided to do that if, if he was going to step down. And then about a few months later, he told me, he says, I have decided uh, that I'm not going to retire, I'm going to run again. And when I looked at the terrain out there, uh, it looked to me like if I could not become chair of the committee, that I was going to have to fight every two years uh, with a growing Republican constituency, which would ultimately prevail, which they did and that I'd be in a minority with no voice. So I decided I would go ahead and get out. I was 60 years old, and, uh, and that was primarily the reason. Now, a lot of people thought, you know, I had a lot of campaign money at the time, <laughs> about $600,000 if I remember, and we were locked in to where you could keep that money if you wanted to, pay taxes on it and keep it. And a lot of the newspapers uh, thought that what I was going to do is to uh, keep the money, you know, and uh, which I donated all of the money. I didn't keep a dime of it. Uh, kept it for a long time because I thought I might still run <laughs> for the Senate and I could use it, uh, or, or in some statewide if I decided to. But uh, ultimately, I ended up uh, giving it to some free health care clinics, to Young Harris College, to a lot of other uh, After uh, After your retirement, you uh, were appointed by the governor to serve on the Board of Regents, uh, in addition to all of your other activities, and uh, the university system. And you did a great job, according to the person who appointed you. Uh, Zell Miller. Uh, but Ed, uh, it, it's been a great pleasure having you, and I appreciate you taking this time to be with us and to provide this history that I'm sure will be very useful years and years from now. 
Well, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, Bob. It always is. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming by.